What's up? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And from the Dave and Mahoney Morning Show on X1075 in Las Vegas, my good friend Jason Mahoney is on Hoppy Hour. What's up, man? An honor and a privilege to be back on Hoppy Hour once again, my friend. Dude, I was thinking about you the other day as the Morning Show Boot Camp is creeping up very soon. It'll be in two weeks. I was thinking about... A lot of people on radio, when their show gets bigger and bigger in the market, they become less social and they're more just kind of closed in because they just have an ego and they don't like talking to people anymore. What I like about you, Jason, is, dude, you're doing really well in Vegas. You guys are crushing it. The ratings are great, but you've never changed as a person, man. Going back to when I met you four years ago, you're literally the same dude almost a half a decade later. Well, I appreciate you saying that, you know, and I think the reasoning behind not getting an ego and not blowing up and thinking that you're better than everybody else is because it could all change tomorrow. I, we were fired when we were down in Houston uh, in, what was it, December of 2016. We were fired and, uh, you know, no help from our own. The ratings were going up. Things were good. And, you know, you go from market six and then all of a sudden you're out of a job. You never know who you're going to be working with or working for in this industry or who your, uh, you know, who, you, who your partner may be down the road or who you may need a favor from. So just treat people the way that you want to be treated. Be cool. Treat people the way that you would have liked to have been treated when you were in their position. And, uh, I think everything will fall into place eventually. And, uh, Things of that nature will uh, continue to help your career throughout it. Now, how nervous were you guys when you went back to Las Vegas? Were you guys confident that you had regained the listeners? Or was there any part of you guys where you were nervous that the fans would think you kind of turned it back on Vegas, fair or not? No, I think that's a, I think that's a fair statement to say that there were some nerves that, you know, like people could be upset. You know, the way that everything played out, when we went down to Houston, the way that it was supposed to work was we were taking the show that was wildly successful in Las Vegas and we were going to move it to a different format, but on, you know, under the same CBS broadcasting umbrella. And, uh, we were going to pipe back into Las Vegas. That didn't happen. Uh, once we got there, we found out that, that wasn't going to happen. So that kind of sucked. So our show was no longer going to be on in Las Vegas. So, we always wanted to be back in Las Vegas. So coming back home, it, there weren't nerves about like, was the show going to be good or things of that nature. We knew the show was going to be good, but we weren't sure if it was going to be as successful as it was because people may have thought like, well, these guys thought they were too big for us, which wasn't the case. We were kind of pushed out in the situation that we were in down in Las Vegas under a different general manager. And so the way, you know, it all kind of unfolded the way that it did with us having to go to Houston and so we did but coming back you know the listeners embraced us immediately the new station uh, program director Ross Mahoney he you know was fantastic and was very instrumental in making that happen almost seamlessly between the two and the listeners you know they jumped right back in you know we left the show at number one with men and uh, and a couple demos in persons and you know when we left it dropped you know I mean the, the morning numbers fell down to like number 22 or something r ridiculous like that. And Dave and I were like, well, yeah, it's going to take about six months to a year to regain all the traction that we were at. And next thing you know, you know, the first three months that we were back, the show was already back in the top three with men. Three months after that, we were number one. So it happened so much quicker than we ever thought that it was possible. And, you know, we have amazing fans and listeners at the radio station of the show to thank for that. You know, they, uh, they, a lot of them, you know, crazy enough, followed us down to Houston, stuck with the podcast, even though the show had changed quite a bit. But uh, it was it was really humbling and, you know, heartwarming to know that people still cared and that they were still invested in what we were doing in the morning on the radio. Now, when you first came back to Vegas, what was the first thing you thought about that you didn't realize that you would miss? Like, what was the one thing in Vegas immediately when you left and when you came back? You're like, this is why I like Vegas. This is why I love this town. 
Well, the music, first and foremost. We went to a mixed station down in Houston, and coming back to Las Vegas, we're at an alternative station, Dave and I. We've always been alternative guys from the get-go. That's why we got into radio and, uh, you know, getting to play music that we were interested in and liking. That was one of the big things, you know, just from a work standpoint, from a professional, or excuse me, from a personal standpoint, just being around friends and family again, you know, being here with our support systems, having all the people that we had spent, you know, 12, 13 years uh, getting to know and becoming friends with. And my girlfriend, who's now my fiance, she stayed in here because she has an amazing job as a vice principal. And now, uh, you know, being able to be around family, friends, all that just makes a world of difference when it comes to just mental health and being happy where you're at, in my opinion. Now, the alt radio format that you work for, if it's at X1075 or with all the alt radio channels through iHeartMedia and Cumulus and uh, Entercom, do you think there's a recent growth in that format of radio? Or do you think now there's just like a thing where it's huge on social media? Do you think it's getting more popular by each day or has it been the same way since the beginning? I think it's growing. You know, I think the alternative audience, the way that alternative is now, it's way wider than it was uh, for the last, you know, I mean, it started about, you know, like four years ago, I think is what it really, four or five years ago, really started to expand the sound and really change what alternative was and what alternative meant for so many years. I mean, from like 19, or excuse me, from like 2002 to about 2012, it was really, really hard you know, guitar driven. There was a couple of bands in there that didn't fit that mold, but they weren't getting played on all the alternative stations, only some. Uh, but I think alternative has become what it was like in the nineties. When you go back to like the, uh, mid to early nineties, when you had bands like Hootie and the Blowfish, Alanis Morissette, Tracy Chapman, and then you also had Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. And then you could also play some Cypress Hill in there or the Beastie Boys. You know, alternative was much bigger and more broad back then and i think that's when alternative was kind of at its heyday as a format and especially that's what hooked me as you know a young man listening to the radio and loving music and wanting to get involved in it and so i think we're kind of getting back to that because you you have the more hip-hop sounding stuff you have the more edm sounding stuff you have the more there, there's there's still some rock in there occasionally even though it's, it's it's ground out a little bit right now you've got that pop alternative that's big as well so i think alternative being bigger has led to a bigger audience and that's why we're seeing more and more stations pop up across the country when it comes to alternative it's been one of those formats that's been underserved for years when we lost howard stern uh and was, that was i think what 2006 or so is when he finally went off the air and all the stations um you know we saw so many alternative stations fold because you know howard was a driving force or at least the corporate culture thought that howard was the driving force as well plus the music had kind of gotten thinner as well so we saw so many big time alternative stations that people grew up listening to and that we you know we really look to as good alternative stations just start falling off the map and x1075 you know was we were extreme radio back then here in las vegas and we were the first extreme radio station back in 1996 and we were the last extreme radio station and that fully the last nail in that extreme coffin i mean it was right around 2010 when our uh, program director, Cherise Rouget, came in and she took over and became uh, the program director at our station, but never called it Extreme Radio again, just because there were things like Extreme Doritos and the, the name had lost a lot of the edge. And so it was just kind of cheesy. And so that's when we fully embraced the X1075 portion of our moniker because it was Extreme Radio X1075. And then we just dropped that first part and we've been X1075 ever since. And it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, an amazing thing to see a station go through the evolution that we did for you know the last i mean 22 years now that the station has been on the air and you know the we've got people who were kids when they were first listening to the radio station now they have kids of their own who are that age who are listening to the show it's it's really an amazing part to be a part of that community and these people's lives how does it feel for you man think about it when the king of all media left fm radio like 12 years ago most of the shows that tried to be him and took over his morning slot, 85% of it failed. 
I mean, the, the only ones that really lasted in the long term as a uh, where they were, you know, you had BJ Shea in Seattle. You know, he's had an amazing show for a, a long time, and he's he's done really well post Howard. And then you saw, you know, Rover kind of had, you know, they moved him to Chicago, but it didn't work out in Chicago, so he went back to Cleveland. You know, and he's had a, a wild amount of success since then. But those are the really only two that uh, of the bigger names that I can think of post Howard. You know, the Adam Carollas came in. Uh, we came in after Adam Carolla. You saw Opie and Anthony pop up in a few places as well. You know, nobody can be what Howard was, you know, or Howard currently is. Howard Stern is a media juggernaut. You know, he is the king of all media for a reason. Nobody does it quite as well as he does. So if anybody who tries to actually emulate what Howard Stern does and I think they're just going to fail because nobody can do what Howard does. So that's why I like seeing shows, like I said, like BJ, like Woody, like Kevin and Bean, like uh, BJ Shea, uh, Preston and Steven. Those, those guys have been around for a long, long time. You know, there's a lot of really good shows out there. Rizzuto and St. Louis. Uh, you see these guys do, you know, their own thing. The, I don't think any of those shows are the bigger alternative or the bigger rock shows. The same with us are who are trying to emulate what Howard did and they're all kind of we're all kind of doing what our strong points are and that's why you see you know the difference between all the shows and I think that's why the shows like that have succeeded over the last 10 12 years now how much prep do you put into each show what time do you begin prepping and what time do you go to X1075 like what's the time when you're first walking in uh you know we usually get there about an hour before the show starts you know, we do a lot of the work the day before. You know, we have a really great producer. Our, our, our producer, his name's Ian. Uh, he's been with us about a year and a half now. I mean, complete diamond in the rough. He just came in one day when we first came back to Las Vegas. He was just going to be a phone screener for a couple of days before we can get a producer in place. And he blew us, he blew our socks off, you know, from day one. And so he's been a real big part of uh, cultivating prep. Dave, myself, and Sylvia who's also on the show, we all sit around uh, after the show. We'll, we'll have our meetings, plan out what we want to do uh, the next day, the next couple of weeks, things like that. If there's an overarching overarching story that we're looking at, uh, but like if it comes down to daily prep, we all, after we leave the radio station, I'll spend a couple hours either on the web or other sources looking for, you know, what we want to talk about. Either it's a story from our personal life that we're putting down on email and sharing with everybody on text or on email or, you know, just spending hours searching the web for great content that we know that will resonate with our listeners. Uh, so, you know, we, we spend quite a bit of time when it comes to prep. One of the things we don't like to do that, you know, I, I think the shows that aren't successful do this. They, they don't do their own prep. They rely too much on prep services. Those are a day behind. So what we like to do is like, we like to be ahead of the shows in our market that will not, you know, put in the hard work or don't have the ability to put in the hard work to do their own prep, edit it down and know what they're going to be talking about, you know, three or four hours from now, uh, as opposed to the people that are just going to pull from the prep sheets and rip and read. And, you know, that news is a day old and stale at this point, you know, Hey, you know, you listen to my show today and maybe we're in commercial, you flip over to somebody else tomorrow. They're reading the same story a day later. We win, you know, in, in our audience's eyes. So I think hard work and doing the prep yourself, uh, goes a long way to helping win in your market. Now, there are a ton of radio shows, I won't say any names, that sound like they have no prep. It works for them. They have good ratings, but they have no prep. Say right now on the show, if they're listening, why bringing prep would help out their show. Because, I mean, the more prepared you are, the better you're going to do. That's one of the things that I kind of... I, I love and I hate about the show because there's so many good stories that I want to talk about today, but sometimes we just don't have time to get to all of them. We are always overprepared. We do a four hour show every single day. We could easily do, you know, a six, seven, eight hour show if need be, just with the amount of uh, prep that we put in. Not saying that we need to do a six or an eight hour show because that's pretty long, but I'm saying we boil down the best of the best of those stories and, and, and just, it's all the hits, you know, it's almost like top 40 radio in a sense, play the hits, play the best songs, play the, you know, play the story, play the bits that you do that are going to resonate with your audience the most, you know, so that's, that's what we do, you know, stick with what is the biggest news stories, the funniest news stories, the most interesting news stories and go from there. And if shows aren't doing their own prep, 
you know, I, I, I don't think you can be shocked if, you know, the ratings don't follow. It, it, hard work wins. You know, I was talking to my boss, Ross Mahoney, earlier today, and we both agree that, you know, talent is a natural gift that is given to you. But we both will take somebody who is a hard worker over a natural talent almost nine times out of ten because hard work wins. People who have hard work, you know, who have that ethic, hard work ethic behind them will continue to do what they need to do to win. Whereas people with talent, you know, if you, you're just naturally gifted at something, you flame out or something along those lines. You know, I've seen so many people who are naturally gifted, funny or smart or, you know, have amazing voices and they've gotten pretty far in their careers, but they don't have the extra oomph that they need to continue for a long term, you know, and it's not about winning uh, this month or winning this book or winning this year. It's, it's the long term thing. You know, anybody can do radio Monday through Friday, you know, it's like they can do it for a little bit, but not anybody can be a winner for, you know, five years in a row, 10 years in a row, those sorts of things. You know, you look at a show like Kevin and Bean in Los Angeles, you know, those guys are an institution down there, been there, I think close to 30 years at this point and have been on top of the ratings. And even if the ratings slip a little bit, you know, they still have, you know, 29 years or 28 years of winning. And that's what, all, you know, I don't think a lot of, that's what separates the amazing shows from the good shows. You know, having that determination to continue day in and day out and embrace the grind. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It only matters what you did today and what you're going to do tomorrow. You can't rely on, you know, the uh, the heritage of your show. You've got to put in the hard work. And that's why I admire guys who I see getting into the building. You know, I see waking up at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. and they're in super early and they're just grinding away because they know that's what they need to do to succeed. Hard work always wins and pays off. You know, there will be bumps along the road that, you know, we all fall down. We all get kicked. You know, it all, it all sucks at some point. But if you have that hard work ethic and that drive behind you, you know, it, it's going to be shorter and shorter in between those down times and those kicks aren't going to land quite as hard and you'll, you'll end up succeeding in the long run. Hey, Jason, uh, it's Kevin, one of Ryan's uh, co-hosts here. You're speaking my language, my man. Um, going back to the music, you know, a lot of people think about the 80s, uh, but you touched on the 90s. Is there less prep when you talk about music that comes from the 90s? Is, does does that quality of music make it that much easier? I, I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of those bands from the 80s and 90s, or excuse me, well, from the 90s, you know, you know, who might not be putting out new albums, but they still might be on tour. They're active on social media. If you're, you know, a jock in this day and age in, in 2018 and you're not following every band that's on your playlist on Twitter, Instagram, every form of social media, following all the music blog sites, the fan pages, you know, that's one of the things when I was jockeying that, you know, they weren't as big as, you know, 10, 12 years ago. But one of, you know, what I see successful jocks doing right now, you're involved with the fan pages and things of that nature where you're really getting inside information that's not getting picked up by all the, you know, like it might not land on Facebook or it might be harder for the average fan to, to find. So, you know, really getting involved in the music and, and taking pride and being a, a fan of music. I think you should be a fan of the music if you are a jock on that radio station. You know, morning shows, I still think you should you should like the music that you're playing, you know. I think those two go hand in hand. You know, like for us, you know, we've had positions where they, they've wanted us to play less music and talk more, you know, and we've done that over the years. You know, we started off when the show first started, we were playing, you know, something like 10, 11 songs an hour, then it drops down to, you know, and it slowly drops down. Now we're playing about five or six songs an hour, but I feel like those are natural breaks in content that help keep the, you know, the overall momentum of the station and the show in the morning flying. If you don't like what we're talking about right now, well, here's going to be a song. If you don't like that song, well, here you you know that in two minutes that we're going to be talking again. So I think it all kind of, uh, you know, works well together if you are a big fan of what, you know, you're, you're selling and what you're representing on your radio station. Now, as a host, is there any bands from the, the 90s that make you, uh, uh, well, that, that you're a fan of, that you want to talk about, that, that consume some of your prep or consume some of your show? So, like a go-to band or a go-to genre? Uh, you know, earlier this week we had, uh, even though he's really not alternative, we uh, we got into some Brian Adams. We were talking about, you know, movies from the 90s. We got talking about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I don't know if either of you remember that fine I do. Uh, film with 
Kevin Costner and uh, Hans Gruber from Die Hard. Yeah. I forget what his actual name is. But, uh, you know, we were talking about the score from that, and it was Brian Adams. And so that led to us playing some Brian Adams and, you know, <laughs> singing along with the uh, that seven-minute-long song during the morning show. But, uh, you know, it, it depends on what they're doing. If it's topical, if it's newsworthy, then I, I think talking about those bands is it makes sense to your audience. But if they really haven't done anything in a really, really long time and you're not doing, like, especially, like, throwback Thursday-type segments, I, I think opining about old music might not necessarily be the most interesting and engaging topic. Alan Rickman, by the way, that sounds Gruber. There we go. There we go. God, rest in peace, man. He was so good. Yeah. So damn good. Jason, how much do you guys think about the ratings? What I want to know is for like a radio show that's number one, do you guys get nervous ever when the new book is about to come out? Or do you guys just kind of take it by day and just give it your all? No, I mean, I love it when the numbers are good. You know, I mean, I'd be lying to say that, you know, you see a number one next to your morning show when you're looking at the book. It, there, there's nothing that feels like it. You know, it feels great. But there's sometimes, you know, that like, you know, the numbers just aren't there. And it's going to be the, in the course of every show, you know, that you, know, you lose a meter or you lose a diary and the numbers just aren't there. What do you have to fall back to on then and what we've done uh, in years past when, you know, the show dips a little bit and you hear, you know, management talking to you about like what you can do differently. Know that you're just doing the best show that you can. If you are doing good radio, the ratings will follow. You know, you got to get out there. You got to be a part of the community. You got to do everything you can to, you know, live that lifestyle that your listeners are living as well. Uh, but you know, if if you are doing good shows and you're, and, you know, you're 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 happy and you feel like I'm giving it my all and the ratings aren't there, they will be. They will come. The numbers will come back. They always have. And uh, but you know I'd be lying to say that there there there's not a a bit of joy, you know, knowing that your hard work has paid off. You know that uh, recognition, even if nobody else sees it. You know we don't talk about ratings on our show. You know on the air hardly ever. You know if anything we we, we make fun of how many listeners are listening. We say we've got seven listeners here in Las Vegas, and two two of them <laughs> one's my fiance, the other one's my mom. So we've only got five, but. You know, knowing that knowing that you, you, you have accomplished something, and even if it's just internal with your own staff, your boss, or even within the show itself, you know, it, I'm proud of doing or, or having a good product and winning. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great feeling, in my opinion. Now, what is the key to keeping it real with Dave but being friends? Because you hear a lot of times – that radio shows hate each other and then just end up breaking up in the long haul because oh, yeah. of their egos. What do you and Dave do? You've been with each other for nine years. What is your key? Because I know you guys are friends, but I can't imagine you also have fights. So what is the key to making it work over the years? The key to making it work is not being an asshole, plain and simple. You know, <laughs> you know, it's not rocket science. Just don't be an asshole. You know, Dave and I, yes, we've been a show together for nine years. Uh, we've been friends longer than that, though, for I think almost 14 years. Now we're going on, we're going on 14 years. He moved here in 2004, 2005. And, uh, you know, from the moment he moved here to the radio station here in Las Vegas and took over the afternoon show while I was part time and overnight at the time and later became nights. Uh, you know, we just were friends and I got an opportunity to go down to San Diego and do a show down there. And, uh, I was working with a guy who's very talented, uh, Matt Bates or Matt Diablo, great storyteller, you know, helped me out. Uh, you know, we were, he was my first real radio partner in a morning show setting. And we, we had, we had issues, you know, we were just apples and oranges, uh, you know, cats and dogs when it comes to personality types and how we had, uh, you know, viewed how to do a successful morning show. And it was put together that way. They wanted a show at the time that would butt heads, that would argue a lot. And in that particular instance, it was hard to separate the heated, uh, aggression and arguments from the personal life outside of what was being on air because it was so heated. It was a great show and, you know, the station was, was 
kicking butt at, t- at the time, and uh, but we just couldn't get away from that, and so we ended up, you know, having a lot of disagreements. And Dave, on his half, had a couple other partners, and one of them who, you know, was one of the funniest guys I've ever met. But they just could not mesh well together. And so around 2008, 2009, when we decided to put the show together, you know, after working with partners who were less than desirable in our eyes, we said, "Hey, man, like." You and I, we've always been friends. I respect what you do. You respect what I do. Uh, let's let's do a show and just not be assholes. Let's not deal with all that bullshit because doing radio is amazing, especially if you're having fun doing it. If you can share doing a show with someone who you care about on a, like a personal level or even on a friendship level, you know, like you know, like it makes it so much more rewarding because you get to share in the joy and all that. And it makes it easier when you go through the hard times. We went through a lot of hard times together, program directors who hated us, uh, management who wanted to see us fired, management that fired us, these sorts of things. So basically what it comes down to is that we, you know, we just don't let a little shit bug us if we have a problem with something that's going on which you know 99.9 percent of the time that doesn't happen but if there's something that's bugging me if there's something that's bugging him that i'm doing he'll, he'll tell me and we have a conversation about it you know over those you know 13 14 years that we've been friends we've had maybe five fights and they uh, they end in about 10 seconds it's screw you screw you and then we're back to where we were and you know it's forgotten i can't even tell you what those fights were about you know it's been so long you know and i feel like we're blessed in that sense but i also feel like it's like a relationship that you would have you know with a girlfriend or a significant other you got to really put in effort into that relationship to make sure that it is working uh you know you can't just be all about you or you can't let them just be all about them it really has to be about the show and you know dave's not the star of the show i'm not the star of the show ian's not the star of the show either is so the show is the show the show is the star the show will go on with any of us missing or any way like that you know and that's what we look at you know we don't care who gets the laugh just so long as they're a laugh and that we all succeed together you know that's that's kind of the the philosophy that we've had going forth and you know being i i feel blessed to have you know been working with an amazing partner like Dave for the last nine years, because I know there's a lot of people on radio who, who get paired with people that they can't stand. And it just makes it miserable. And it sucks because it's such a amazing business that we're in because, and, and if you can't enjoy it, it's just, I just, I just, my heart goes out to you. You know, I hope you can find a partner who, you know, appreciate you for who you are and what you do and, you know, you for them and because it, it just makes everything that much better. And I think you become that much more successful. I've always said for many years, you know, outside of the hard work that we put into our show, we're not the funniest. We're not the best looking. We may be the tallest alternative rock morning show in the country. But, you know, the thing that we have that a lot of shows don't have is that we do have that friendship. We have that chemistry that exists naturally outside of radio and outside the studio. Even inside the studio when the microphones are off, we're still laughing, having a good time, you know, enjoying each other's company. You know, me and Dave, uh, we live, I want to say, maybe not even a mile and a half apart from each other. You know, his wife and my fiancé are great friends, so that helps as far as family life. So traditionally, we see each other six, sometimes seven days a week. You know, I know a lot of people think they would get tired of that, but when you are around people that you can enjoy, it just makes it uh, that much easier. Now, where do you want to see the show in the next five years? It's a question, you know. I think we always want to grow, you know. I'm not the... uh, I'm not the, the hustler like Dave is. Dave uh, has, you know, 17 jobs. He's hosting things for the World Poker Tour. Uh, he's hosting events for ESPN. He's doing all sorts of things all over the country, uh, mixed martial arts hosting. You know, we, we do a little bit of that together. We do a little bit of commentating together on that realm. But he's producing award shows. He's always looking to grow the show, and it's, it's been a great benefit to me to, to see the drive that he has. His drive has made me uh, more ambitious as well, you know, because when I thought, think about what I wanted to do 15 years ago was, you know, I want to be a morning show in Las Vegas. And that's, I mean, that's kind of all I really want to do is be a morning show in Las Vegas. I love 
that, you know, the city means so much to us and our families here and our friends are here. But we would also like to grow the show with Las Vegas as well. So I would say five years, you know, I would love to see, uh, you know, our home base here in Las Vegas broadcasting to, you know, another 10, 15 radio stations all across the United States, if not the world. You know, I feel like we are a, a pretty accessible show. We're always, uh, we're easily digestible, we're likable personalities, and you know you're going to get a laugh when you tune in. So, you know, we'd like to see the gr- show grow some more. But even if it didn't, I'm perfectly happy here in Las Vegas. You know, we've got a great team, and it's a great city, and there's really no place like it on Earth. Jason, again, you're speaking my language, and, you know, speaking of the good times, I love your positivity. Uh, is it? Do you have a surreal feeling, um, being in the business so long, where you've met celebrities and are star- starstruck? Did, does anything overwhelm you? No, not really. I mean, I, I would say there, there's a, a few occasions where that happens, you know, uh, it, it's always awesome to meet these bands and be able to meet like movie stars over the years and have all these, you know, uh, celebrities come in, you know, meeting Mike Tyson when we, you know, he's come into our show a couple of times. He's based here in Las Vegas. Yeah, that he was surreal. Here, yeah. He's a childhood hero, you know, talking to Brandon Flowers on our first day back in Las Vegas and him welcoming us home and saying, hey, I missed you guys. And, you know, having him listen to the show when he was living here in Las Vegas, That's that was kind of that. surreal. He's like, Meeting him for the first time, you know, many, many, many years ago, uh, you know, he, and him going and him saying like, yeah, I didn't expect you guys to look like you did, you know, or I didn't expect you guys to look like this. And, you know, we're like, well, we That's didn't expect you to look like your right. show, you know, so stuff like that is a, is a little bit surreal. But, you know, the thing that makes me the happiest is meeting the listeners, you know, it's like these are the people who are paying my bills, yeah, yeah. you know, without them none of this would be possible. You know, if you didn't have the people who believed in you and let you become a part of their daily routine, then you, you know, we would be out of a job and I'm blessed to have been working in radio as long as I have, you know, it's, it's the greatest industry on earth. It's the best kept secret in the world. As far as entertainment goes, you know, you can, uh, you know, there's the ability to make a whole lot of money for some people and the ability to remain anonymous. And, you know, most people that just overlook it, you know, but it's a medium that reach reaches so many people in so many intimate ways every single day and uh you know there's really nothing else like it out there and uh i love it you know so that's that's one of the reasons that i feel blessed to have been in radio for Dude, as long as i have level. as long as you know as, as well as staying gainfully employed and keeping a roof over my head jason level with us uh, do you have a gambling addiction living out there so long <laughs> uh no but i love to gamble though right. i love to gamble you know and if you live in the city and you have a gambling addiction you will go broke soon you know i uh i want a bunch of money last year i mean like a stupid amount of money so i decided to at that point in time i'm like it's never going to get better than this moment in my gambling life like it's never going to be better than this there is no thrill that is going to be bigger than what is happening right here and so i haven't really uh haven't really done a whole lot so since that moment you know occasionally i'll play a little bit of keno on the machines when we're out but uh you know for me, I think I've I think I've lived my gambling life. You know, how, how I hit really money? low lows. Uh, I one night I won ten thousand dollars playing blackjack, right. and then lost ninety five hundred of it uh, <laughs> about four hours later when I got really drunk and decided that I need a couple more thousand dollars on top of that ten thousand dollars. So that was a that was a pretty big low. So you know, and I've hit some like I said the last year hit a hit a huge hit a huge 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 win, and uh, that was um, you know that was it for me. Now, where can people find your show, and why should they tune in? Uh, if you're if you're looking for something fun to listen to, you can find us on we're on iTunes. Just search Dave and Mahoney. But if you're searching that, which I got to fix this with our company, it's the little amber sand, not the word and. It's the amber sand. That's it's weird that those two aren't like synonymous with each other, but that's just the way that iTunes works out. Uh, you can find us on the web. Our podcast is also on uh, the X1075 website, x1075lasvegas.com. All social media at David Mahoney or davidmahoney.com. That'll lead you to all of that stuff as well. And if you're just looking for, you know, some way to kill some time, you want to feel like you're hanging out with a couple friends, just shooting the, shooting the breeze, having a good time and laughing at stupid stuff, you know, we're your guys. Now, Keep up the good work. You're going to be at the morning show boot camp in two weeks, right? Yeah, you know I would, Hobby. Dude, Wouldn't miss it for the world, my friend. I'm going to be there with Randy from the Woody Show. He's going to be my roommate. We uh, split the, uh, not rent for the room, the uh, payment to the have a room yeah. 
during the morning show boot camp, we split the payment, so we made it work. And then Menace was able to help me fly out to Chicago, so I'm very excited. Dude, as usual, we have to party hard, man. It's so much fun at the morning show boot camp. You know, this will think I think it'll be our fourth or our fifth morning show boot camp together. You know, it's always a good time. I look forward to every year seeing you out there, especially, you know, in your hometown of Chicago. So it'll be even better this year that we're going back there, and it's going to be a great time. And, man, looking forward to seeing you, man. It's been too long. Well, dude, keep up the good work, and I will see you in two weeks. Perfect. You keep it real hoppy. Love you, man, and uh, keep up the great work. All right. Thank you, bro. Have a good night. All right. Take care.